Today we're going to be canning some beef stew. I have to wash our garden produce here. So we grew four different varieties of carrots this year. And uh, I have an entire bed in the garden strictly with carrots. I'm going to have to harvest some more, but we have our carrots. We have some celery and I don't, I don't really put celery in my beef stew, but um, I needed to use this up, so I'm going to put uh, so I'm going to put all that celery in the beef stew that we can, and if I run out, that's fine. I took out some of our beef roast that we have in the freezer, and I have more in there. So what I plan to do is can all of the beef roast into beef stew that I have. I buy our potatoes in bulk. From Azure Standard, I've been ordering from them since 2011. I've always been very happy with them. So each year I order about 200 pounds of potatoes and can them as just strictly potatoes. But this year I'm going to take my last 50 pound box that I just ordered and I'm going to use them for beef stew. As you can see, I have already scrubbed our garden grown carrots and I am just peeling them and then I will just chop them up into bite-sized pieces. The carrot peelings, you can do whatever you would like with. You can compost them or feed them to your goats or your chickens. You can freeze them and add them to vegetable broth later, or you can use them right now and maybe put them in a carrot cake, you know, shred them up fine, put them in a carrot cake, or maybe make like a carrot soup, add them to some muffins, all kinds of things you can do with them. Here we have our carrots. They are all chopped up and ready to go. Here are the potatoes. You can see they are wet. I scrubbed them really good with this little scrubber brush in water. Removed all the little dirt and everything. Got into all the little nooks and crannies. Now whenever you go to can potatoes, you are supposed to peel them. You're supposed to remove the skin on potatoes. But as you can see here, the skin is so so thin. It's like paper thin. I can just rub my finger. You can see some right there on my finger. I can just rub my finger or the tip of my nail on the skin and it just literally rubs right off. So I am not going to peel these potatoes. I just made sure that I scrubbed them really, really well. I'm just going to slice these potatoes a few times and make them into cubes and they will be ready to go. I cubed up all of the potatoes. They are sitting in this large bowl and they are covered with cold water. That way they don't oxidize and turn brown. Here I am showing you some skins from the potatoes that I did peel off. So I peeled off anything that you know was damaged. So I peeled off any bad spots or any spots that were damaged on the potatoes. For the celery, I did the same thing. I scrubbed it really well under running water. I'm just going to dice up some of the celery pieces. Now whenever you go to can your beef stew, you can can the celery with just the stalk or just the leaves or both. It's perfectly fine. You want to make sure that you remove any bad, damaged, diseased pieces of the celery just like you would with any of your vegetables. And you only want to use the fresh and firm. You don't want to use any soft or mushy parts of anything when it comes to canning, period. Now any of the remaining celery, like if you don't want to use the tops, you can throw them in the freezer and add them to, to make your vegetable broth later if you want or you can take them, dry them, dehydrate them, and you know have dried celery for the future use. Now here comes the most time consuming part. I'm going to take all of these beef roast and I'm going to have to debone them, remove the excess fat, and also do my best at removing all the sinew or tendons that there might be running through it. We won't know what all is in there until we actually go ahead and cut into it. Now all the stuff that you cut off, including the bone, go ahead and throw in a freezer bag. Make sure you label it. 
and uh, go ahead and label it as beef bones for broth. And when you get enough, you can go ahead and make some beef broth and then can it at some point. Whenever we go to cube up these roasts, we want to cut against the grain each time. So when you have your big slab of meat, this particular roast had the grain running one direction. So I cut across the grain in the other direction. Well then each little piece that I cut, I look at the grain and then I might have to change directions and cut it. It's kind of hard to explain. It's something you just have to see. So you just want to look for what direction the grain is running on the meat and then cut across that. Okay. And that just helps to make it not as tough, um, especially whenever you go to chew it. It's, mo it's more tender because it kind of falls apart a little easier. The reason we want to remove as much fat from the meat as possible when canning is because when you're pressure canning, you know, it's at a very high temperature, like a minimum of 240 degrees Fahrenheit. And so that fat is actually melting and it's boiling and bubbling up inside the jar. And um, it can actually come up to the very top of the jar and come between the mouth of the jar and the lid and kind of seep out. And if you have that fat between the lid and the mouth of the jar, it can cause your lid to fail and you will not get a proper seal. And you really don't want to waste all that expense and time, obviously. Not to mention that it is not recommended to can fat anyhow. There's a possibility that the required temperature might not be reached inside the center of the fat. So they just recommend not canning anything with a lot of fat in it. You might be wondering what type of roast I am using. Honestly, it's a variety. It's whatever I pulled out of the freezer. So there are some chuck roast, arm roast, shoulder roast, rump roast. There might be some others. Those are the only ones I can think of right now. So yeah, it's just any type of roast that I get, Is this is what I do. Now all of this will get put in a freezer bag and will be labeled beef for broth. And the rest of it is what we will can in our beef stew. Here you can see we have all the ingredients prepared. The meat is cubed up, the potatoes are cubed up and in water. The carrots are also chopped up and ready to go, as is the celery. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to canning. I'm, I'm taking one teaspoon of canning pickling salt for each quart jar. You don't have to use canning or pickling salt. You can use just plain non-iodized salt is fine. You can put your ingredients in the jars in any order that you want, um, but I personally find that putting the meat in first is just the best way to go. You can see here I am putting in two loosely packed cups of the beef roast into each quart jar. That's actually too much. Um, once you actually open the jar and, you know, after it's been processed and you, and you go to open the jar and, you know, you cook it a little bit, the meat just really falls apart and shreds and you actually get more meat than you realize. So I think, you know, anywhere between a half a cup to one full cup is just right for a quart jar. Okay. So we got our salt, we got our meat. Now I'm just putting in a cup, a cup and a half of the potatoes and a cup to a cup and a half of the carrots. And then I just throw a little bit of the celery on top and I am packing this down in here as good as I can. Remember all of this stuff is raw. Okay, so we have filled up our quart jars with the raw ingredients all the way up, leaving one inch of headspace. And if you look at the jar, one inch of headspace is to the bottom of that bottom ring there. And you can also see with this headspace measuring tool I have, we have one inch of headspace. Now it is time to fill our jars with boiling hot water. So I have a funnel in the jars and on the stove boiling I have some water. I'm just taking a ladle and funneling the water into the jars here. 
As we are ladling the water into the jars, we are watching the water level in the jar. We want the water to come up to one inch of headspace, and once it looks like we meet that, we'll need to take something to remove the bubbles or the air pockets from the jar. You can take this green bubble popper. I just got this, I think, last year or the year before. I'm not sure. Um, before I got this, I always, I always used a metal butter knife um, or a chopstick. Perfectly fine. Anything that you can get in there and wiggle around in the food to help release the bubbles, the air pockets, is great. So the way that you want to do it is you want to take your bubble popper go on all four sides of the jar between the jar and the food and kind of push inward you know to release any trapped air between the jar and up against the jar with the food and then also go down into the center of the food and push or wiggle outward okay so that's what you want to do you can see that boiling water just almost like instantly slightly cooked the outside edges of the meat all right so we want one inch of headspace. So after we remove the air pockets, we measure our headspace. And again, we want one inch. When you remove the air pockets, a lot of times um, your water level will go down as the air comes out of the jar. So you may need to add some more water. If so, add it. You just need one inch of headspace. Okay, once you have your one inch of headspace, you need to take a clean cloth dipped in straight white vinegar and wipe off the mouth of the jar. The reason for this is because the vinegar cuts any grease. So, you know, and since you're dealing with meat here, there could be some fat. And you want the lid to seal, to have a 100% seal on the jar mouth, so you don't need anything obstructing it. So you put your lid on, you put your band on, fingertip tight, and once that's all good, stick it in your pressure canner because beef stew has to be pressure canned because it is a low acid food. All right, and you just continue that on until you have all of your jars filled up and in the canner and ready to go. I have all of my jars filled up. They're all in the canner. So now we're going to put the lid on the canner and process the jars accordingly. Okay, so for your elevation, you'll need to see how many pounds of pressure or PSI that you will need to pressure can at. I live below a thousand feet elevation, so I process mine at 10 pounds for 90 minutes for quart jars. So the canner I have, it has a dial gauge and a weighted gauge. Um, I have a short little video where I cover a, using a weighted gauge. And in that video, it kind of also shows a picture for using the petcock screw if you don't have a weighted gauge like my old canner did. Um, and that video also kind of tells you what a jiggle is, what venting means for a canner and stuff like that. Make sure that your weighted gauge is not on the canner, okay? If it is, take it off. And then once you have the lid locked onto your canner, turn the heat up on high and you want your vent pipe that you see here, you want it to be steaming. So you are looking for a steady stream of steam coming up from the vent pipe. Once you start seeing that steam come up and it is steady, set the timer for 10 minutes and let the canner vent for 10 minutes. When the timer goes off, go ahead and put your weighted gauge on over that vent pipe. Or if you have a, an older canner like I used to have, then close your petcock screw. Once you put the weighted gauge on or you close your petcock screw, you need to wait until the weighted gauge starts jiggling and or your dial gauge reaches the required pounds of pressure. Once the required pounds of pressure is reached, that is when you will start your processing time. So for quarts, for beef stew, they need to process for 90 minutes. So that is when you would set your 90 minute timer. Once your 90 minute timer has gone off, you want to turn the heat off of the stove, but leave the canner on the stove right where it is. You want the canner to cool down 100% naturally, completely on its own. You want the dial gauge to go all the way to zero all by itself, and you want the jiggler to not jiggle and to be perfectly quiet. Once it is quiet and it's down to zero, then you can remove the weighted gauge. So get like a pot holder and go ahead and remove the weighted gauge and set the timer for two minutes. Once that two minute timer has gone off, go ahead and remove your 
pressure canner lid, but make sure that you remove it to where the steam goes away from you. Okay. After you remove the lid, set the timer for 10 minutes. Okay. After 10 minutes, then you can go ahead and carefully, without tilting, you can remove the jars from the canner. Always make sure that you follow the instructions that came with your canner. Again, carefully, without tilting the jars, remove the jars from the canner. The reason you don't want to tilt them is because the jars are not completely sealed yet. So if you were to tilt the jar, any liquid or little food particles could seep between the jar mouth and the lid, and it would cause your seal to fail. Okay, so then you'll just put the hot jars on an elevated rack or a thick cloth to protect your counter and leave them alone. Do not touch them for 12 to 24 hours and they will seal. If you have any water on top of your lids, it'll evaporate off, so it's fine. Here they are the next day. Um, I already tested the seals and I have a video in that playlist as well on how to test the seals. So I already tested the seals, they all sealed. Um, I took the bands off, tested them, I wiped the jars down. Now we will label them and put them in storage. You can watch my other video where I open one of these jars and I show you exactly what it looks like. I even, I even crush some of the potatoes, the carrots, and the meat between my fingers so you can see just how tender it is. And then I also cook it and... Um, just show you what it looks like. Here I'm just showing you that I reuse my lids up to three times. So each time I use a lid, I put a little line on it. So one line means it's the first time using the lid, two lines, I've used the lid twice, three times, I've three lines, I've used the lid three times. You know, you might, you probably saw that lid had said salsa. I, I've always reused lids. I did that ever since I started canning. I didn't know you weren't supposed to. I've never had a problem. Thanks for watching.